Well, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be here. And uh, this is an ambitious topic, and it's a difficult time. We're here on several different anniversaries. We are at the three-year anniversary of the Lehman uh, bankruptcy, basically today, the 10-year anniversary of 9-11, which was uh, uh, the focus in New York uh, two days ago or three days ago. And when we talk about the financial crisis, it's no longer quite clear which one we're talking about. We're, uh, we're in the middle or the beginning. I don't think we're at the end of a new financial crisis. And so we need to talk about how do we structure portfolios? How do we think about this financial crisis and the last financial crisis in, uh, as investors and as policymakers? And I think we've had uh, an excellent introduction to many of the both political and economic issues this morning already. So let me try to say a few things that are a little bit different. Uh, I want to talk about portfolio lessons from the crisis. And when I use this uh, title, I'm thinking about the financial crisis of 2007 to 2009. But I think we'll see that there are a great deal of similarities, and possibly it is still the same crisis we're facing today. At Stern School at New York University, we spent a long time studying the financial crisis. Uh, 30 faculty got together and wrote this book in a very uh, few months in 2008. It's received a lot of critical acclaim. It looks at lots of different aspects of the financial crisis. And because that was so much fun, we had Financial Crisis Two, which was published last year, discussing the regulatory reform that followed the crisis, the Dodd-Frank bill, and gives various uh, interpretations of parts of that bill. So rather than suggesting that we all read these two books before we go any further. Uh, let me give you a quick summary of, of two lessons that I think come out of this. First of all, many investors of all kinds, whether, whether they're CEOs, risk managers, rating agencies, traders, or regulators, took more risk than they expected. There was clearly a failure to appreciate the risks that were on the horizon. But secondly, we have focused a great deal of attention on the fact that many of these same individuals were paid well to ignore the risks. That the financial system rewarded people quite handsomely for ignoring risks. And that has been the focus of most of the regulatory reform, to change the institutional structure so that that uh, feature is, is less apparent. It's not clear yet whether that's been successful, but I'd like to focus more on the first topic. Why did risk management fail, and how did it fail? Were we prepared? Obviously not. Are we prepared today? Probably not. So, um, there's been a lot written about this. We have ideas like black swans and, and predictive failures and the failure of all financial models uh, proposed as explanations for this risk management uh, failure. But I don't think that these are necessarily what we're talking about. Uh, and I think we want to be a little more specific about what failed and what didn't fail. And so I'm going to show you some sort of simple results, give us a, an idea how to, how to ask this question. Uh, I think many models did fail during the financial crisis, but many others didn't at all. Uh, and so, but 
then why do we make these mistakes? Okay, so let's think about that. So one of the things we could think about is we spend a lot of time trying to predict what's going to happen to asset prices, but it turns out what we can do a better job of is usually predicting what kind of a confidence interval they'll lie in. So if we look at a time series of asset returns in, in blue there, which is the S&P 500, and we look at estimates of the forecasted volatility one day ahead from a, uh, from a GARTS type model, you can see that the amplitude of the volatility has changed dramatically over time. We have low volatility period here in the 90s. The uh, internet bubble here between uh, and, and the Asian currency crisis. And then the low volatility period here in uh, up through 2007. And this picture stops exactly when the financial crisis starts. This, is, this picture ends in end of July 2007. And this is an example of a volatility model of, uh, of the kind that, that uh, the, uh, the Nobel Prize was connected to, the uh, Arch and Garch kinds of models. So the question is, how accurate would these confidence intervals be if we ran them through the financial crisis? Did it give good estimates of how much risk was being taken in the financial crisis? So without changing the parameters, we're going to go forward and look at the same kind of picture, but using only parameters that were estimated before the crisis to see what these confidence bands look like through the financial crisis. And we have here the financial crisis of 2000, starting of 2008 is in here. This is the uh, 2007 third and fourth quarters. I'm echoing a little bit. And what you see is that these confidence bands included almost all the returns that were observed. Then we get here to May of 2010. That's when the Greek crisis really erupted. And finally, this data goes through uh, two weeks ago. So you can see that this confidence band got incredibly wider here indicating the high volatility that we've seen over the last few uh, few weeks and the renewal of the uh, sovereign debt crisis that we've been talking about this morning. So how do these bands do? Well, basically, they give you a pretty good estimate of the kinds of risks that you're facing. It doesn't appear that this model has broken down at all, even though it's just a simple uh, time series kind of model. So, and particularly if you look at, at the returns divided by their predicted standard deviation, you can see that this is more or less a bell-shaped curve. It's got a little more weight on the downside than you would expect, but it's not that far from uh, what your risk management uh, team would have thought. So, um, how do we understand this difference between the view that risk management failed and this simple model that seems to have done all right? Well, we can actually look at a broader class of, of assets, and we have a, a website called uh, VLAB, which is a volatility laboratory where every day we calculate volatilities and correlations and actually systemic risk measures for a variety of hundreds of assets and uh, publish these, and this is the website. So what do we see when we look at this? So here, for example, is the S&P 500 with a plot through, uh, through September 9th, which is uh, Friday, I guess. And the curve in red is the volatility, and you could think about that as this measure of risk that goes through time. What's also plotted on there is the VIX, which is the measure of risk from the options market. Completely different set of data, but as you can see, they mostly move together very closely. The bottom curve 
is simply the data. In green is the level of the S&P. In blue is its change. So you can see the amplitude of the, of the returns. And when we look at the far right-hand side of this picture, we can see the uh, effect of the August volatility on these forecasts. In fact, if we look a little more closely at the August, uh, the last three months, you can see we have multiple different models, but they all predict pretty much the same thing, whether it's, it's the VIX or it's different kinds of Garch models. It's, there's a model that uses the interdaily range with uh, that was pioneered by my uh, friend Jean Piero Gallo and I. I don't, I'm not sure whether Jean Piero is here, but anyway, this is the. Uh, so we can follow these models from several points of view. If you look internationally, you see what this crisis has looked like from European point of view. Here are a series of European equity markets, and uh, what you see is that the Italian index in red is typically the most volatile of these series, but now it's been joined and surpassed slightly by the index in black, which is Germany. So this volatility that we think of the sovereign debt crisis in Europe has raised the volatilities of the UK, Spain, Italy, and Germany very dramatically. Uh, I, guess, I guess I don't have France on here, but, but, but it also has increased the volatility of Germany. So it's important to think about why, why would German volatility go up when Germany is the strong country and Italy and Spain are the ones that are being uh, targeted by, by uh, investors with, who've lost confidence. Well, since we do this every day, and we did it every day during the financial crisis, we can ask, how did these forecasts done in real time perform? And the answer is basically in a paper that we've written, but let me just tell you, essentially during the financial crisis, these models performed just about as well as they did before the financial crisis. So where does this failure of risk management come from. The point that I want to emphasize here, and it's a very important point, is that these models are predicting volatility one day ahead. And they do a good job of predicting volatility one day ahead. So when you ask whether they can predict the financial crisis, the answer is yes, one day ahead. But it's obvious that that's not good enough. Why isn't it good enough? Well, it's actually good enough for a day trader. It's not good enough for somebody who invests in long-term assets. And I think this is not a point I want to make about volatility models. This is a point about risk management. We do our risk management typically using the tools, value at risk, expected shortfall, correlations, and so forth, are focused on short-term risk rather than long-term risk. And the main difference between short-term risk and long-term risk is this bottom little statement. There is a risk that you're ignoring when you use short-term risk, which is the risk that the risk will change. And we've seen so many examples of this, but the most obvious ones are where you think there is no risk, but of course, from a long-term point of view, there is a risk. And when you go from zero to some other number, it, it makes a big difference in your, uh, in your risk management and in your portfolio decisions. So we want to we talk about that. Um, so just looking at the at historical buildup to the financial crisis, we had a period of very low volatility. And in periods of low volatility, it's natural for financial institutions to look for more returns. Where do you find more returns? With more risk. Increased leverage, increased risk. There was a, 
a search for higher risk products. This led to the structured products of CDOs, subprime mortgages, as ways of finding more risk and more return. And if you were worried about it, you could buy insurance from AIG and other firms that have not been able to uh, survive. So then, of course, what happened is volatilities rose, correlations rose, the low volatility products and the, low, the high leverage products suddenly became riskier. Investors who went to sell them found that there was no market for them because no one wanted them at the new higher levels of volatility. When you think about correlations going up, you think that about CDOs whose tranches suddenly all become equally risky. They're not the, the it's, you're not so safe in the uh, senior tranches anymore. And yet, this rise in volatility was really not a surprise. It was not a surprise to the options markets. It wasn't a surprise to anybody who studies volatility to realize that volatility is not always going to stay as low as it was during that period. So it's easy to say, yes, pay attention to long-term risk, but how do we do that? Well, I'm, one suggestion that I'm going to make is to use measures like VAR and expected shortfall with long horizon returns. Try to figure out what would the one year ahead value at risk be for your portfolio. Another way is to try to use economic forecasting. And in particular, we have a strong tradition of scenario and stress testing. But the difficulty with doing stress tests was discussed already this morning, which is you never know which scenario to put high probabilities on. And it's easy to find scenarios that make your portfolio underperform, but how do you decide which ones are plausible and which ones are not? So let me just give you uh, a quick picture. We're going to use a vol the same volatility models that we've done for short-term forecasting, but simulate this into the future because it tells you how fast volatility is likely to change. So if you do lots of different scenarios, say 10,000 simulations from this model starting at the end of July 2007, you get quantiles that expand. This is the lower part of the quantile. There's an upper part here that I'm not showing, but it shows what the confidence interval ought to look like for long horizon returns, allowing the risk to change. And it's considerably more uh, pessimistic than a scenario which looked only at independent and identical returns where the volatility was held constant. Here is the risk that we see in one day. That's the value of risk. But here is a one year, two year, and so forth risk. And what you see is it took two years before the S&P, which is shown in blue, collapses down into this interval, but it does actually hit that interval. And we can actually increase the performance of this by using options data, which have a view of what the volatility would be going forward. Now, on this website that I told you about, there's a new section which is designed to do exactly this problem every day. So today, or well, September 9th, when I pulled these slides, we have an estimate of what the one year ahead 1% quantile is for the S&P 500. And the 1% quantile is shown in red. It's this number down here, which is about 60 some percent down. So if you want to do a scenario starting on September 9th of what you might expect the outcomes to look like a year ahead, this is the answer that you would think about. A 60% uh, decline in the S&P. So if you want to protect yourself, that's what you should protect yourself against. Now you can see that it's a lot worse than it was before August. And so this is 
one of the things about the rise in volatility. We don't know whether it's going to rise more or come back down, but this is, this is the, like the worst case scenario. In blue is the same thing using options data, and the uh, green and, and black ones are the same things using um, the 5% quantile. So you can see, of course, the 5% point is not so bad. It's down like 35%. How about for the DAX? What is the 1% quantile a year ahead for where the DAX could be? Okay. Well, it's also down 60%. The 5% is down 40%. So, and this seems to be the same whether you use the options data or not. So the options markets agree basically with this with the simple Garch model, and it gives you an idea what you might want to protect yourself against in the long run, or in, in a year horizon anyway. Um, there's another portfolio problem, which is actually the same, although we think of it rather differently, and that's the banks. Banks have a portfolio. They borrow from us, they borrow from other investors, they borrow from depositors, and they invest in a bunch of different assets, loans, businesses, and they take a great deal of leverage because they borrow a lot to do this investment. So if these assets pay off, stock prices go up and banks pay dividends, if these assets do badly, then they take a lot of risk and the bank is threatened with uh, bankruptcy or at least distress. How does the bank therefore choose its lever, level of leverage? Well, it's the same kind of argument. It, has, it depends on the risk. And it depends, the risk depends on the volatility. So if volatility is low, banks feel like it's safe to take a lot of leverage. If volatility is high, it's not so safe to take a lot of leverage and they'll keep a bigger capital cushion. So the problem is if you do this using modern risk management techniques, you're going to focus on short-term volatility rather than long-term risk. And I think one of the reasons why we had a banking crisis in the U.S. is because banks took leverage based on measures of short-term risk, which were very low, rather than measures of long-term risk, which were higher. I think the sovereign debt crisis in Europe looks the same. The, the uh, sovereign debt was low risk in the short run, but I think everyone knew that Greek debt was really not as safe as German debt. In fact, it didn't pay the same. So why do you invest in Greek debt instead of German debt? Because it pays a little higher uh, coupon. But that coupon is exactly the market's response to this issue. So I think that, in fact, as investors, we knew this. But we didn't have the calculus to, to analyze it. So in any case, this is the case for regulation. US and Europe have both put in new regulatory regimes. Neither of them are fully operational yet, but they're working on it. And it's natural if the banks take this risk and thereby expose the real economy to risks, it's natural to regulate that risk. That if you think that the failure of a large complex institution like Lehman Brothers or like the European banks that were th are threatening, which are on the on a very uh, shaky footing at, at the moment, if their failure is going to impose costs on the real economy, it makes sense to reduce the amount of risk that they can take. Of course, it's hard to do that when they're already in trouble, and we may be past that point as far as the European system is, but if if we are going to put capital into these banks to recapitalize them, which my forecast is that's what's going to happen, we better have the regulatory apparatus in place so that they don't expect this in the future 
and that they don't take excessive risks uh, and thereby require it. So what is the expectation about long-term risks? Well, maybe this is what we're talking about, or maybe this is what we're talking about. Dancing with Barack. I don't know. Uh, what, how do we use this information to form portfolios? That was the thing that I was, I'm trying to uh, focus this on. Well, one thing is to do market timing. Sell these assets before the risk goes up. Uh, I think that's what people are trying to do now, but of course there, it's, you're always too late if you're doing market timing. A second is you could buy protection, but the people you buy it from are going to charge a lot because they have to hedge this protection. So the, the main portfolio strategies, I think, are the third and the fourth, which is one, to take a smaller position in these assets that have long-term risk, and the second is to try to hedge them. And how do we go about hedging them? Well. If you want to hedge an asset for a financial crisis, you want an asset that's going to go up in a financial crisis. Which assets go up when there's a financial crisis? Well, it turns out now we think of volatility itself as an asset class, and that certainly went up during the financial crisis. It's a great asset for hedging, except that it's very expensive. Um, other assets that go up during a financial crisis seem to be gold, treasuries, and the dollar. There's no guarantee that any one of those three will go up in every financial crisis, and of course, you know, that's the problem of putting on these kinds of hedges. Um, what, you, what kind of hedge do you put in place for if you're worried about a sovereign uh, debt crisis? Well, you probably you hedge with more secure treasuries. Volatility will still do you a lot of good. Maybe gold, maybe the dollar. It's hard to know. These, the, the solution of hedging is, is problematic. Uh, I think it's the reason we see these dramatic rises in the exchange rates for Switzerland, Scandinavia, Australia, Brazil, and China. And, well, I guess exchange rate in China hasn't gone up, but the cash flows are, are enormous. These cash flows are in part looking for hedges for these kinds of uh, crises. On VLAB, we also have some correlations. So we can see how these correlations would have done as a hedge. Let me just be sort of brief about this. Here's correlations with several potential hedges with the U.S. S&P 500. And the, uh, the top one here is emerging markets. So is that a hedge against changes in the S&P 500? Well, this correlation has been pretty stable over time. It seems to be about 60%. So it's not exactly the same asset. It might provide some diversification effects. Here's gold. And gold's volatility goes up and down. Zero is right here, more or less the red line. And you can see that gold sometimes is positively correlated with the S&P, and sometimes it's negatively, including in particular right now when it's got a correlation of minus 0.4. So gold has the possibility of being positively correlated in good times and negatively correlated in bad times, but it has a whole lot of volatility itself. And this is really a consequence of investor behavior rather than a consequence of any kind of fundamental value. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a pretty uh, speculative approach to uh, hedging. Here are corporate bonds, or treasuries, I guess, which are negatively correlated with the S&P and have been for since 07. It's not always true, but typically they are negatively correlated, so they actually provide a reasonable hedge. And down here is volatility itself. A couple other possibilities are um, IFA, which turns out to be correlated 0.9 with the uh, S&P. Real estate, also 0.9. Energy, energy might be a good hedge against global warming, but it's not a hedge against the S&P as a whole. These are all very highly correlated with the S&P. More effective are the dollar itself in, uh, I, I think, uh, blue, and corporate bonds in green. So 
One of the reasons for putting some of these relatively low performing assets in your portfolio is that they may outperform in a financial crisis. And that, I think, is a reasonable way to think about them. So let me stop here uh, and urge you to uh, take only the risks you intend to take, in particular including long-term risks as well as short-term risks, and consider reducing exposure to long-term risks by hedging. But remember that hedges often lose money too. So this join me in the Arch Cafe, which I guess is going to be over here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.